Hi, I'm Shelley Fold Nasso, CEO of the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship. In this video today, I'm going to share a little bit about the Cancer Care Planning and Communications Act, which is what we'll be talking about in our virtual Hill visits. So let's get right to it. So a little bit of background about this legislation. It was introduced in July of 2021 by Congressman Mark DeSaulnier, who's a Democrat from California, and Congressman Buddy Carter, who's a Republican from Georgia. These two are uh, co-chairs of the House Cancer Survivors Caucus, and um, they have worked together on a number of pieces of legislation. They work together really well. Right now, Congress is a little bit dysfunctional. There's not a lot of bipartisanship, um, although we know that there's been a, a little bit of bipartisan legislation passed recently, but it's, it's pretty tough. But uh, uh, fortunately, we know that cancer is not a partisan issue. And in this case, uh, Congressman DeSaulnier and Carter work really well together and have made sure that this is a bipartisan approach to cancer care planning. Congressman DeSaulnier is a cancer survivor himself, and Congressman Carter is a pharmacist by training and has had a lot of experience with cancer in his family. I think both of those uh, facts give them a lot of credibility about this legislation. Um, right now, there's nine co-sponsors in the House, and what we're hoping to do through, the, through our virtual Hill visits is to increase the number of co-sponsors. It has not been introduced in the Senate. Um, of course, it needs to be introduced in both houses in order to pass, but right now it hasn't been introduced in the Senate yet. So we're hoping that we can find someone who will introduce it in the Senate. So that'll be part of the ask when you're meeting with your senators, is to see if they are interested in, in, codes, in introducing it in the Senate. So what does the legislation do? It would create a new Medicare service for cancer care planning. So what this would do is give uh, physicians payment and incentivize them to, to have a uh, cancer care planning session with their patients, a, a, a meeting specifically focused on this and to provide that cancer care plan. The plan would be delivered to the patient at the time of diagnosis when the initial treatment plan is determined. And when there's a change in treatment, if there was progression or if there was a concern about um, side effects from a certain treatment and there was a change in the course of treatment. And then, of course, at the uh, transition to survivorship in the form of a survivorship care plan. Um, so these are the times when, when patients would get this. We know that sometimes this happens. Uh, they are, they are uh, paid for the time they spend with patients, but a lot of times putting together a cancer care plan really requires more than the time that's spent face-to-face -face with a patient, and this would be an enhanced payment to really uh, give them the ability to, to spend some time on the back end creating a plan for the patient and then have that face-to-face -face time to deliver that plan to the patient and also help with some of the coordination that's a, a part of the planning process in terms of uh, coordinating with other physicians who are part of the cancer care team, uh, specialists or primary care physicians that are, that are part of the care of the patient. So why is this important? Well, we love this, um, this visual because it really shows the complexities of cancer care uh, with the patient at the center, but all the different uh, providers that are part of the discussion about the diagnosis and then the discussion about treatment, the treatment of different um, comorbidities and side effects. Um, and so it's very complex and, and you all who are cancer survivors and caregivers know how, how what a burden this places on the patient and his or her family to really coordinate that care. So we believe that this bill would actually help uh, patients by giving some of that um, incentive and funding to the, and payment to the cancer care providers to help with some of that coordination of care. There, the cancer care planning has been recommended by the National Academy of Medicine and other medical professional societies. It's been part of payment models that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have had to uh, in, incentivize care planning as part of a overall uh, payment model that they've done. And so it's it's been recognized by experts as important to the cancer care uh, treatment process. But we hear from you and from uh, in our survey that most cancer patients do not receive a written plan and they're left to navigate their cancer diagnosis and their post-treatment survivorship without clear direction. When we asked in our 2020 State of Cancer Survivorship survey if you, if you had received a cancer survivorship, uh, sorry, a, a survivorship care plan, less than 20% of the respondents had received one. 
So the benefits of the legislation, and this fact sheet will be available to you to download so that you can um, review the details of it and also share it with the person that you're meeting with, um, but it basically will help cancer patients by supplying them with a tangible map or a plan or roadmap. It'll promote shared decision making between patients and their cancer care teams so that patients are not left in the dark about their treatment and really help empower patients with information necessary to manage and coordinate their care. And we believe it will also help providers deliver the right care at the right time and better coordinate a patient's care and use resources effectively. So when you get into your meeting, um, you can use the, your telling your, the Telling Your Story worksheet to help you work out your story because you're, you want to make sure that you have kind of a short version of your story. Remember, the meetings are not long. You may have 15 minutes. Um, they may be scheduled for a half hour, but you, you may only get 15 minutes of time with a, with a member or their staff member. So you need to be able to tell your story succinctly and make sure that everybody in the meeting has a chance to tell their story. So you share your name, where you're from, your connection to cancer, and say that you're an NCCS advocate. You say that you're there to advocate for the Cancer Care Planning and Communication Act, which is H.R. 4414. Uh, you share your story, and then you make the ask. And so if they are already a co-sponsor, you thank them for that. If they are not yet a co-sponsor, the ask in the House, the ask is, will you co-sponsor the legislation? In the Senate, the ask is, would you be willing to champion the Senate version of the legislation? Another thing that's important is think about who you're meeting with. If you're meeting with a Republican member of Congress, lead with the fact that Buddy Carter is the lead on it. He's the Republican co-sponsor. Um, now, the Democrats are in the majority in the House, uh, but still lead with the Republican because they're going to resonate more to hearing about one of their Republican colleagues leading this. You can also mention that Congressman Carter is a pharmacist uh, by training because often uh, members of Congress really defer to people who have the expertise in their um, in their field. So I think hearing from somebody who's a, a healthcare professional will help um, give credibility to this. If you're meeting with a Democratic member of Congress, talk about Congressman DeSaulnier leading the effort and how he's a cancer survivor himself, and he knows why this is important. He's very passionate about improving communication. You can watch the video that we uh, we recorded an interview with um, Congressman DeSaulnier talking about his experience, why this is important to him, and that I think will also help you give you some of his motivation for why this is important. So it's important to lead with the member of their party when you're talking about it because that's who they're going to resonate with. The Republicans do not care that Congressman DeSaulnier is leading this effort. They want to hear about Buddy Carter. So that's how you can really tailor your messaging to who you're meeting with. In this case, sometimes you have different talking points about the legislation for Republicans versus Democrats. In this case, it's really not a particularly partisan issue. It's just a matter of who they're going to they're, they're going to have that signal from their member, their colleagues, and they're more interested in what their Republican colleagues are, are supporting than hearing about a Democratic uh, person if you're talking to a Republican member of Congress. So after the meeting, um, tweet to thank them for, for meeting with you. You can take a picture of your Zoom screen. Um, you can restate the ask. Definitely send any thank you emails uh, with responses to any questions that they may have asked, or you can include us in your thank you email if there's a question that was left unanswered and you need uh, us to help you respond to that question. Follow up with staff if there's any action items. Um, if your member does take action and, and agrees to sign on, thank them and their staff. Um, you can tweet thanks to them and also email them. And remember, this is this meeting is part of building or maintaining that relationship you have with the member and their staff members. So the virtual Hill meetings are the week of July 11th uh, if you have registered to participate in virtual Hill week. You will receive a meeting request from Ellie Donahue on the NCCS team with the Zoom link to the meeting. Um, NCCS staff may join in the meetings. You let us know if you want us to be there, if you're new to this and you would like that support. We also may join particular meetings if the if your member happens to be on one of the committees of uh, important jurisdiction where we, they, sometimes if your member's on, for example, Energy and Commerce is one of the committees that's going to be really important to this bill. 
And if your member's on that committee, you may they may have a health staffer who's really a little bit more informed about healthcare issues than some others. If you have a member who's not that interested in healthcare policy, they're more focused on another area of policy, then they may have a staff member who covers four or five different issues, one of which is healthcare, and they may not go as deep into the weeds about um, some of the policy issues. But if somebody is really focused on healthcare and is on the Energy and Commerce Committee, their staff member may be more um, knowledgeable about the issues and may have more difficult questions that you might not know the answer to. And th that it helps us to be in that meeting and also helps us to make sure that we can kind of follow up with you with them after your meeting and have that connection from NCCS. So we may drop in on your meeting just for to help with our advocacy for the bill, but also if you need help with your meeting. So please let us know if you feel like you would like to have somebody supporting you in the meeting. Um, we have a drop-in uh, Q&A scheduled for July 11th from 4 to 5 p.m. So this is after the virtual symposium to answer any questions you may have uh, about the legislation or to help you prepare. If you have any schedule changes, email Ellie and she can work with you on that and, and coordinate with the, the members' offices. Um, I just want to add a couple of other points. Um, remember that you may be meeting with a staff member, not the member. It's, it's less likely that the member joins some of the virtual meetings. Sometimes when you're in their office, you may catch them even if they're sort of in between meetings and they'll come and say hello or join the meeting. Uh, they, they sometimes join the virtual meetings, but not always. So, But don't be discouraged if you're meeting with a staff member. They are incredibly important to uh, making decisions, and they are the ones who are going to relay this information. to. They do relay. They report back to their, their member about who they've met with, what the asks are, what their constituents are saying. So they are really important. They Don't be, worry about the fact that they may be very young and may not seem to have a lot of experience with cancer. They're still important to the decision making and, and don't feel like you're not um, getting your point across because you're meeting with a staff member because they're critical to the process. Also, one question that may come up, and it often comes up in Republican offices, but could come up in any, uh, any office, is how much is this going to cost? Uh, we don't have an exact uh, amount that this will cost right now. It is a, an additional it would be an additional meeting uh, with the with your doctor and you, and so it could cost money for the Medicare system. Uh, there's a potential that uh, better coordinated care could save money. We can't we don't have data that supports an exact cost savings, but it's it's potential that if you're better coordinating care, you're eliminating any duplication of care, and it could be cost savings. Um, we don't have an actual a definite cost estimate. It's something that could be developed if the members ask the um, Congressional Budget Office to do a score for this bill, but that hasn't it has not yet been scored. So if you get asked that question, we don't know the exact cost. It's not incredibly expensive in the scheme of cancer care. When you think about the most expensive elements of cancer care are your medications, um, hospitalizations. This is really just one office visit with your physician. It's not expensive in the in the grander scheme of, of uh, cancer care, and it would actually re really help improve the patient outcomes and um, that coordination of care. So that's how I would answer the question if it comes up, and it, and it may, especially in in Republican offices. So I want to thank you so much for your advocacy. It's really important for your members to hear from you um, and your stories, and that's what's going to motivate them to sign on to this. There's no one who really opposes this legislation. It's something that um, other advocacy groups and professional societies support, but it's just not as high a priority for some people as other legislation. So that's why your members of Congress hearing from you is so important to get them to sign on and show that support for this le legislation so that we can try to move it forward. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the Q&A on July 11th.